I'm Dave Boos, pastor of Hebron Independent Church of Cade, South Carolina. Thank you for joining us for our study of the Beatitudes of Jesus. These are found in the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Today we'll be looking at the fourth of these Beatitudes, and I believe this fourth one is crucial to our understanding of the Christian life that we are called to live. The Beatitudes of Jesus are not meant to be steps toward Christian perfection, nor are they phases in the idealized Christian life, but they are interlocking links that connect the believer to the kingdom of God, and they have a very real present application as well as a future fulfillment. Those who are poor in spirit recognize their spiritual bankruptcy before God and realize that that bankruptcy is caused by their own sin and their own failures. They mourn because their own sinfulness and the sin of others is so obvious around us. And yet they realize that they are to be comforted by the same Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. There is a meekness because their spirit has been cleansed of pride and self-will. They look to God for his forgiveness and his grace. And they look upon others, understanding that same grace and forgiveness that God has given us. And now the fourth beatitude. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's much emphasis today for social justice and rightness. I'm kind of reluctant to call it righteousness in this context. We've seen the signs every night. Justice for George Floyd, justice for Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, and so many other different protest signs. And I'm not going to go into the motivation or the validity of these protests, except to say that these are a few signs of the times that call for social justice and accountability of politicians, of police, of corporations, of different groups, are each and every one of them doomed to failure because they deny any foundation that is based upon the existence and righteousness of God himself, and they ignore any personal responsibility and righteousness on the part of God's people. And without the righteousness of God, and without the righteousness of God's people, there is no reason, no pattern, no motivation, and no hope for any kind of social justice or rightness. I'm afraid we have become sort of like the child who receives the good old Southern blessing. Every intention and every desire of their heart is to do good, to do right, yet just somehow it seems like that kind of gets away from them. They never quite get it done. Their intentions are beyond their ability. And so we shake our heads and we have a wistful smile as we say, bless their hearts. What is this righteousness that Jesus speaks of? Righteousness is always rooted in the Old Testament. From Genesis to the prophets, righteousness of man is always founded upon the righteousness of God. And it's conditioned by man's faith in this righteous God. Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed the Lord and is accounted to him for righteousness. The psalmist wrote, as the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And the prophet Amos said the day would come when neither God nor his word might be found. He said, behold, the days come, say the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek for the word of God and shall not find it. I think this aptly describes our nation today. Also, the righteousness of God is personified in Jesus Christ. God's glory, his grace, and his truth were seen in the incarnation and in the birth of Jesus himself. His holiness and righteousness, his divine authority, were seen by all and rejected by so many. It was such righteousness and holiness in Jesus that compelled Peter to cry out, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. And compelled Thomas, doubting Thomas, to say, to acknowledge him as my Lord and my God. 
there are some things that righteousness is not. Righteousness is not any form of personal ethical perfection. Jesus often reprimanded the Pharisees and other religious leaders because of their arrogant self-righteousness. And even Paul, who himself had been a Pharisee, wrote in Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Righteousness is not social standing or reputation. That is a, misconcept, a misconception even today. And it's not a contest. We do not become righteous by comparing ourselves with everybody else. But I do believe there are three aspects to our righteousness. There's a legal definition, there's a moral character, and there's a social expression. Remember that Matthew lived with Jesus on a daily basis. He was not concerned with theological concepts as those offered by Paul and by Luke. Imputed righteousness and justification by faith, these were not terms that Matthew used. But I do believe the doctrinal seeds had already been planted by the ministry of Jesus. Matthew's experience with Jesus was before the cross, even before the believer's legal standing before God had been established. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, by his sacrificial death on the cross, by his subsequent resurrection. And according to later teachings, that righteousness of his was imputed to us or counted to us. So now we've come back to Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Well, many Christians seem to rely upon this imputed righteousness, yet they don't realize the moral implications that it might have for our daily lives. But what benefit is there to being saved or being justified if we never live like it? Jesus saved us so that we might live right and righteously before the Lord. But there are also social dimensions to our righteousness. It is not wrong for us to desire God's righteousness in our world. And it is not wrong for us to work to make that righteousness known by all. But because of so much opposition, so many Christians have become timid and reluctant to advocate for the kingdom of God. This week, as we, the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett as a Supreme Court justice is being considered. And the greatest opposition against her has been to deny her her rights to express her faith in the courtroom. And it's not so much that they are against her as they are against God and his word and Jesus and the Ten Commandments and anything that has to do with God. But they cannot fight against a God they don't even know. Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. As he often did, Jesus referred to physical needs of man as he described the spiritual needs. In this case, he talks of hunger and thirst. Now, Jesus was not speaking to people who had an overweight problem. Many of the people in the crowds around him were living on a subsistence level. They were borderline to hunger and thirst at all times. And Jesus spoke in terms they knew only all too well. In addition to physical needs, there often are the psychological needs for attention and affection, companionship, love, and recognition, and so many other things. And as deeply as the desires for physical needs might afflict us with hunger and thirst, demanding to be filled, there should also be within us a desire to receive those things we need to sustain our spiritual lives. The best example might be that of the prodigal son once again. Luke describes his condition he says he spent all that he had. He began to be in want. He was sent to the field to feed the pigs. And there he said he would feed himself with the husks that the pigs rejected. His downward spiral reveals his physical condition of bankruptcy, his empty pockets, but also a spiritual bankruptcy, an empty spirit. 
and his needs and his desires had become extremely acute. We know that Jesus hungered after 40 days in the wilderness, that he thirsted while on the cross, but yet he rebuked his tempter because of his reliance and his trust in his own father. He spoke of God as provision. He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He talked about a continuing fellowship. He says, you shall worship the Lord and the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. And he also desired the approval of his father when he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And he received that approval when God spoke to him and says, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. We should have the same desire for God's provision and for his fellowship and for his loving approval. These are some of our spiritual needs that we hunger and thirst for. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Filled. Satisfied. Needs are met. Well, how? Well, through Jesus Christ himself. John 6, 35, Jesus was speaking to the crowds that the day before he had miraculously fed with five loaves and two fishes. He says, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. In John 7, 37, he stood in the temple and he called to the worshipers who were passing by on their way to, to the sacrifice. Any man who thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his belly, from his inner being, from his spirit, from his soul, shall come streams of living water. Our desire, our spiritual hunger and thirst must be for him, for Jesus himself, and for the righteousness of God. And now our needs are met in part each day, but we still have a hunger and thirst recurring. You can't just eat one time and that satisfies you for life. Spiritually, we sort of become like Oliver Twist as he stood before the headmaster of the orphanage asking for seconds. And he says, please, sir, I want some more. Our needs will never be completely filled until we reach heaven itself. S some would say that the blessing is not so much that our desires are fulfilled as it is that we have the desire to begin with. Being hungry allows us to appreciate the meal that is set before us. Being thirsty causes us to enjoy every drop of water. And being hungry and thirsty for his righteousness causes us to seek for the ground of blessing where we might know his blessings and be fully blessed even more. Like the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, turned to Jesus and said, Sir, give me this water. A few weeks ago, we studied the 23rd Psalm. We read of the shepherd and it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. In other words, he makes sure that his sheep are adequately fed. He leadeth me beside the still waters. They are able to drink their fill. But remember the next verse, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The path of righteousness. That is what we, as Christians, should be seeking each and every day. We cannot find them apart from God, because God himself is righteous. We cannot find them apart from the leadership of Jesus Christ, because he is the one who leads us as a shepherd leads his sheep. And we cannot find them apart from the Holy Spirit that indwells us and guides us day by day. For he is the one who imparts the righteousness of Christ into our lives and motivates us to live a Christ-like life. Thank you for being with me today. Let's join together in prayer as we close our session. Father, Lord, you alone are completely righteous. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much you sent your son to give his life for us. And that through Jesus, we might have righteousness and that we might live righteously. We pray, Lord, that you might give us that strength and that desire, that hunger to be more like Christ every day and fill us with your Holy Spirit to overflowing with joy and peace and love and hope and all the other gifts you've given us. 
Lord, help us not to hunger and thirst for the wrong things, but to seek after you and your kingdom and the blessings that only you can provide. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you for being with me, and God bless.